Hi, and welcome back to How to Kill a Piano. My name is George Tate. It is Monday, and I'm trying to release these every Monday uh, when I have the time to. So this is our third installment of How to Kill a Piano. Thanks so much for coming back. If this is your first time, there's good news and there's bad, and there's bad news. The good news is you're here, and I thank you. And... There's other parts of the story you haven't heard yet. The bad news is there's other parts of the story that you should probably go listen to first before you listen to this part. But of course, you know, live your life. If you want to listen to it all out of order, you are certainly entitled to do so. Part three of how to kill a piano. What we might do, just to break up a few things, because to be honest, while this story has, uh, much of it has been written, and while it was a stage play, it was a very different play before it was this version of the story. Every version of this that we have done has been a little bit different, uh, has been more detailed as each installment has come through. There was a very, very small comic strip that existed. Uh, There was this blog post that existed, which is what this is an extension of. And, of course, the play, which was the original part of this that was a one-man show. And as a one-man show, Charlie did not exist. Screwtape and Wormwood were not part of the story, at least not outwardly. It was more of a stripped-down version of a Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner, which was juxtaposed as myself and the piano, myself being the coyote and the piano being the Roadrunner. And of course, the Roadrunner, as in the Looney Tunes, always won the battle. Spoiler alert. Anyway, uh, so there is a certain point where I will come to where I have not fleshed out the story uh, in detail as I would like to that I have been representing in this podcast. So what we might do is talk a little bit about and take some of these Monday episodes to talk about the original show and what that included and so on there is definitely a story arc there is certainly a storyboard that exists i know where the story goes i know how it falls out i just don't know every single detail on the path to the end and hopefully we'll get to know that together but for now enough about that let's get to part three which is simply called the delivery I don't know why they chose to drop me onto Charlie's doorstep some years ago, but I never regretted it. Not even the day, just before my seventh birthday, when two peculiar men showed up in a fancy moving van with the words, Balls Movers, on the side. It was freshly painted in an elegant red script that looked straight out of one of Uncle Charlie's antique catalogs. I was sitting in the kitchen, peering through the window when they pulled up. It was the hottest day of the year. You could see the heat radiate from the driveway, like a snake suffocating its dinner as it surrounded the truck. I still remember the vanity plate reading 616. The two men were of surprisingly diminutive stature, short to put it coarsely. They donned what were probably once pure black business suits, but looked to have faded so much that they were now a mixture of various greys with complementing ties tied slightly askew. They both reeked of smoke. One man was slightly taller, younger. How much younger is hard to say, and carried a briefcase. The older man was shorter, rounder, and held a clipboard and a cane that came to a sharp point at the ground. Despite their scraggly dress, both men wore shoes that had a shine that reflected back like fire. I had always had a knack for seeing the secrets that hide behind folks' eyelashes, but it didn't take an expert to see that these two men were up to something, even before they opened their mouths. When Uncle Charlie answered the door, I was behind him. Good morning to you, sir. I'm known as the mildly affectionate Mr. Screwtape, and this is my protege, business associate, and dearest nephew, Mr. Wormwood. The second taller man hardly broke a smile at his introduction. We're here in regards to the winnings of a Mr. Baudelaire. Mr. Charles Baudelaire, is he in? Screwtape inquired. Leaving the screen door safely latched, Uncle Charlie spoke back with a minor annoyance that only those close to him would have noticed. I'm sorry. I think you might have the wrong address. There's no one here by such a name. 
Is this not? Screwtape paused and looked over at our address on the house and then back at his clipboard before continuing. 9624 Lenore Street. I stood just behind Uncle Charlie, not being able to tell if the man was reminding himself of our address or if he was checking to see if he was in the right place. Had I been able to see the other side of his brown hornet-colored clipboard, I would have realized that it simply read, Objective. Deliver piano to patient. It is, Charlie started back, but, Ah, then who might you be, said Mr. Screwtape, purposefully interrupting. I'm Charlie, he responded sharply. Charles, Charlie, they're close enough, really. The piano's yours. It's Charlie Seferic, not Charles Baudelaire. You're more than a few miles away on my name. Last, I brushed up on my knowledge of 19th century French poets. Charles Baudelaire died in France sometime in the 1800s, he said more skeptically, catching the two men in a silence. Good day, gentlemen, Charlie shut the door. The two men stood there for a few moments, looking at first the door, then back at each other, before calling a second time. A different approach then, Mr. Screwtape? Yes, I think so, Mr. Wormwood. Wormwood reached out and rang the bell again. They explained that the piano delivery was the result of some kind of lottery. They maintained that Charlie had apparently won some sort of contest, and that this was the right address, but unconvincingly admitted to possibly having the wrong last name. My Uncle Charlie wasn't the type to play the lottery, let alone drop his name into random drawings. When Charlie tried to turn them away, the taller man began to speak for the first time. "'The truth is, Mr. Arant, Seferic, Charlie corrected while scrunching his brow. "'Ah, yes, Mr. Seferic. We were supposed to make this delivery over two weeks ago. We have been unable to contact the rightful recipient, and if we go back to our boss with the baby grand a sixth time proving non-delivery, we'll have hell to pay.' Literally. The man grinned, like the stereotype of a used car salesman. For the moment, Charlie didn't speak. He simply looked over the two men carefully, in a way only he could. I knew this look. It was the same look that Charlie gave to me, after catching me in the middle of the night, a second time sneaking cookies. The look made me feel so sick to my stomach, in guilt, I never did it again. The two men cheerfully glared back, blissfully unaware of Charlie's tone. The shorter man stuck a finger into the collar of his shirt and pulled slightly, loosening the grip his tie held around his neck. I expected the men to be sweating in their garbs, though neither man showed even a drop of perspiration. This isn't a scam, added Screwtape. If you'd like to make a few calls and see if we're a legitimate company, we'd be pleased to wait. Charlie turned and looked at me expectantly as if waiting for me to come up with an excuse that would rid us of these two men. Well, Charlie taught me well, and I was far from the average child of six. I was still a child. Do you even play, Uncle Charlie? I asked, not knowing what he expected me to come up with. I wouldn't know where to begin, he winked at me before turning back to the two men and attempting to close the door a second time. A business card exchanged hands, and it read, Bilal's Piano Emporium, 616-555-6616. You know, with one of those phone numbers from one of those movies, because they can't use the real thing. It's free, all taxes paid, and we'll give you a receipt that will show you proof of ownership. It was the quintessential model of its class 100 years ago, and made by the Hazelton Brothers. There's absolutely no catch, and while I admit it isn't a grand piano and that it's only a baby grand, it's still very much a beast of an instrument and certainly plays a fine bite. It's true, you would be accepting someone else's prize, but they haven't claimed it, and what an exquisite antique it is. Your young one there will benefit greatly, said Wormwood, finishing with another grin. Uncle Charlie seemed to relax. The men's three-piece suits seemed to grow darker. Uncle Charlie made a few phone calls. To whom? I'll never know. And everything seemed to check out. I don't know how they ended up convincing him. Next I knew the two men were granted full access to our home. They took tape measures to our door frames and doorknobs. They measured our floorboards and walls, our light fixtures and light switches. They even measured my toothbrush, how long my tube of toothpaste was, and counted the nail clippings in the rubbish bin. 
They measured the space under the beds, the diameter of our toilet. Even the pieces of lint in our pockets weren't safe as they removed each speck carefully with a pair of tweezers before scribbling nonsensical hieroglyphics onto their clipboard in some kind of agile acknowledgement. Charlie led them down into the basement and opened the secret panel that led into the library. After some thought and rearrangement, the two mysterious gentlemen concluded that the baby grand piano's new home would be in the center of everything amid the clutter. Somehow, the two men made enough space to navigate the piano to the center of everything. It was a straight shot down the steps after stumping in the side door to the house. The piano bench was carried down first. The two men returned to their truck and somehow managed with unaided strength to carry the baby grand up the driveway, through the gate, and to the opening of the side door of the house. The two gentlemen paused to reassess how best to fit the piano into the house. Mr. Wormwood, it would appear that we'll have to remove the legs to fit it through, said Mr. Screwtape. I watched from my bedroom window as one of the men removed a screwdriver from a briefcase that, when opened, resembled a collection of archaic tools a doctor may have used for torture. He inserted the head of the screwdriver into the slots of the screw head at the base of a piano leg and began twisting. The shaft immediately snapped at its neck. Damn, that was one of my finest tools, exclaimed Mr. Wormwood. While I admire your handiwork getting us in the door, your clever approach isn't going to work in this case, Mr. Wormwood. The boss did say that this would be a tricky job, but we're both professionals. Try the bone saw, my dear Mr. Wormwood, and we'll cut through the screws. We can always replace them with new screws once we've had it down the steps, suggested Screwtape matter-of-factly. Professionals indeed, Mr. Screwtape, came the reply. The bone saw had small teeth and a short handle, an instrument usually used for sawing through flesh and bone to perform an amputation. Wormwood went to work on the same piano leg. He began to grind it against the screw. At first, it appeared as if it was going halfway through, but suddenly there didn't appear to be even a scratch anywhere at all. The saw had been completely bent and snapped into pieces. I find it rather surprising that we shall have to retort to this odd and stubbornly vexatious apparatus with a device that's more subversive. What do you say, Mr. Wormwood? Wormwood returned to the truck and removed and started up a chainsaw. Must I say anything else? The buzz of the saw was jarring as it chewed through each leg of the piano with a sour note. To me, at the age of six, it looked like they were murdering the poor creature as it bled splinters of black ebony all over the pavement. I had to cover my ears, but I would never cover my eyes. Screwtape suddenly exclaimed, Quickly, Mr. Wormwood, before the reassembly! The two men each took hold of a side of the piano, carefully fitting it through the door, and disappeared into the house, down into our basement. With each step the two men took down the steps, their hands began to melt more and more into the body of the piano. The books and boxes seemed to melt apart, providing a clear path to the center of the basement maze. Tilting the piano parallel to the basement floor, the veins in the back of their hands bubbled and popped, transforming their skin tone into a dark ebony. Their arms snapped off at the shoulders next, and their hands slowly began resembling that of ornate antique piano legs. I suddenly found myself in the center of everything, I watched as their shoulders took the shape of pointed piano feet, their fingers wrapped around the body of the piano, steadying it as it sat on what was once the palm of the men's hands. I wasn't scared, but I remember trying to wake myself up as I chased the armless men up the stairs. The books and boxes slowly reassembled to their rightful positions behind me as I reached the top step. I stood there pinching myself as I watched the remains of the piano fly from the ground and attach themselves as arms to the two men. Next thing I knew, I found myself waking up on my bedroom floor. It wasn't the first time I had blacked out. I never mentioned these moments to Uncle Charlie. I was afraid of worrying him. I stumbled into the living room where I found the two men with Charlie, completing some paperwork. The shorter, older man looked over at me and smiled with teeth that looked like they could tear through human flesh. There you are. It's official. You and your son are now the proud owners of your very first vintage Hazleton Brother Baby Grand Piano, gloated Mr. Screwtape. 
If you ever do need it moved again, give us a call. We'll be happy to provide such a service. With our compliments, assured Mr. Screwtape. Enjoy, added Mr. Wormwood with a smug expression. Uncle Charlie saw the man out and bolted the door. I watched out the window as the taller man backed the van down our driveway. It moved slowly until in the street. Once there, it seemed to speed off faster than my eyes could follow. In a split moment, it seemed to vanish into nothing. Inside the henchman's van, screw tape touched his left index finger to his forehead, closed his eyes, and began to speak. A female voice spoke back from the moments ago empty bed of the truck that was too dark now to be sure. Do you think the patient suspects? Screwtape inquired. Of course he does, replied the voice. And that is exactly how we want him to think. Hurry back, gentlemen. I'll be sending you both back soon enough, said the voice. Screwtape removed his finger and opened his eyes. The two men grinned. Thanks again so much for listening to How to Kill a Piano with me, George Tate. The music was played and improvised live to tape by yours truly. The track that you're listening to right now is simply a garage band loop that's free. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and please tell your friends. And thank you for spending a little of your time with me. That really does touch my heart. I'll see you next Monday. <laughs>